Welcome to the wrap-up presented by AT&T. The WNBA playoffs kicked off this afternoon, and what a start to the playoffs it was. A couple of blowouts early on between the Fever and the Sun, the Liberty and the Dream, not very close. The third game, however, different story. The Lynx and Mercury, uh, a very close game, came down to the wire. I am joined by the creator of Highlight Fur, Ari Chambers. Ari, so great to have you with us. Your overall thoughts on day one of the WNBA playoffs. Well, first of all, you mentioned the third game. Thank God for the third game. Yes, it's yeah. <laughs> it's so exciting because we didn't want it to be a complete obliteration of the smaller seats or the lower seats to the top seats, but it makes for great basketball. I know everybody can turn their fate around, but today has just been packed with basketball, and that's what we want. No question about it. We're going to get you caught up on all of today's actions, starting with the most exciting game. Like you just said, the seven seed Phoenix brought their game with them up to Minnesota in game one. Pick it up in the third. Mercury down 13. Tarasi finds an opening, knocks down the three. Mercury cut the lead to 10. All right, third quarter winding down now. The Lynx coming up with the loose ball. Collier gets the pass, hits the three, and the Lynx would push their lead to 11 points. Collier, an amazing game today in the debut of the WNBA playoffs tonight. Fourth quarter now, Natasha Cloud driving to the rack, lays it up. And in, right, it's reverse layup. Mercury cut it to six. Mercury down six now. Tarasi gets open again. Bang, knocks it down. Her team down by three. Mercury back down four. Kalia Copper hits the three. Everybody's dropping in three balls. Mercury down by a score. Fourth quarter winding down. Minnesota looking for a dagger. Who gets the ball? Bridget Carlton pulls up, knocks it down for three. She was Ari's X Factor in this game as well. The Lynx take game one. 102 to 95. So the Mercury trail by as many as 23 points in this game uh, in the first round. It would have been the largest comeback in WNBA postseason history. But at the end of the day, Ari, Minnesota was able to close it out at home, not make the mistakes in the final few minutes. Now, Minnesota, uh, I think, is still kind of new to this whole being a top team in the WNBA thing. Does the way that this game played out, now, put any doubt in your mind that the Lynx are a contender in the playoffs? So, Sam, I don't think they're new to being a top team in the WNBA. Okay. The Dynasty program with the same coach, the consistent coaching of Cheryl Reed. Like we said plenty of times, she knows how to work her players into buying into her system. She knows the game of basketball. She found the right pieces. They might not play fat, flashy basketball, but they know what they're doing. They all have bought into their roles. You have Courtney Rain. Oh, Courtney Williams, one of the best mid-range shooters in the game. You have Nafisa Collier, who had the second best individual player performance this year. You have Bridget Carlton, who's clutch. You have Atlanta Smith, who's a defensive specialist. You have so many different factors on the team. Kayla McBride, who we sleep on all the time, but is a sharp shooter. There's so many different pieces to the Minnesota Lynx that come together to make a top team. They're not number two by accident, and they're not a dynasty franchise by accident so they're not they're not new to this top th team thing but being in the position they're in we might not have believed in them but Nafisa Collier and Kel uh, Courtney Williams both have told us hey we knew we were going to be there because we knew what we have and they have all the pieces that they need I want to turn it over to the Phoenix for just a quick second Natasha Cloud unbelievable in this game with what she was able to do 33 points now she's the first player with 30 points and five assists in consecutive playoff games in WNBA postseason history, you got to go back to last year to add the two together. But she just has a knack for showing up in these big moments. And the Mercury, to their credit, are a very experienced team. Your thoughts on them and their performance that they put on today? I love that you mentioned the experience of this team because even if they hadn't won a championship together, many of them have won championships. And Natasha Cloud is one of them. She's a 2019 champion with the Washington Mystics. And she's a point guard. She knows when to take over and be aggressive and bring that feistiness that's necessary to close out these games, even though they did not, they came up short this time because Bridget Carlton and Atlanta Smith being clutch and feed her consistency. But Natasha Cloud said, we're not backing down. And because we don't know if Diana Taurasi is going to stay another year or are leaving, I think Natasha Cloud really inherits the spirit of Diana Taurasi, knowing that the, the, the baton is being passed to her. And so she wants to make her vet proud. I think all of Phoenix Mercury is going to give all they have, especially in game two now, because it's do or die for them, to make Diana Taurasi's legacy go on and on. You mentioned game two. They'll have a couple of days off, and then Phoenix will try to regroup and battle again and try and force a game three. That would be on Friday if they were able to do that. All right, so first game of the day today, Ari, number eight Atlanta Dream, who were up at the Barclays Center taking on the number one New York Liberty. 
First quarter tied at two. Sabrina Ionescu pulls up from long range, nails the three. New York takes the early lead five to two. Next possession, Stewie getting in on the action in the early going. Liberty by six. Moments later, Stewie finding Leone Fiebisch, who sinks the 22-footer in the corner of New York out to an early nine-point lead. They didn't wait around to get involved in this one. Second quarter, Dream trying to make a run, and they go to the vet. Tina Charles knocking down the jumper. Atlanta cuts it to 11. Later on in the second, Alicia Gray finding Charles, cutting the lane. Dream trying to make things interesting, trying to make a run. Ellie getting the crowd involved, though, doing her thing. Third quarter, New York looking to extend their lead. But Nigel Laney finding Phoebish for the triple. That made it a 19-point Liberty lead. Fourth quarter, we had a little bit of history being made. Courtney Vandersloot gets the steal, lobs it down the other end for Stewie. The easy bucket with that assist. Vandersloot passes the great Sue Bird for the most playoff assists in WNBA history. Liberty go on to win game one, 83-69. to 69. All right, all right, you were at this game. What were your thoughts watching this in the front row on the sidelines? Whew. So talking to the players at the practice beforehand, I know that their goal was to make a statement. Leonie Fubich said, hey, we have to make a statement with this game because historically New York has kind of mimicked the energy of their competitors. So I'm glad they were able to hone in on what their identity is and say, hey, we're at the top for a reason. We have so many offensive threats and we outsize Atlanta in the post too. And so we're meant to have this sort of lead. And that's what they said from from minute one. And that's what Cindy Brandella wanted from her team to really show up as New York Liberty has shown up this whole season. We've seen them kind of, you know, their energy, we question at some points of uh, the season, their heart, we question some points of the season, but everybody needed to do, did what they needed to do today. And we had a record performance by Leonie Fubich. We had a record breaking performance by Courtney Vandersloot, even though um, they weren't necessarily looking for one to shine any more than the other. You have the consistent pieces of, of the Liberty, but it was, it was a Liberty said, we have to make a statement and they did. And I give them a lot of credit, too, because while it didn't mean a ton in the grand scheme of things, that final game of the regular season, still, to lose that game and knowing that you're going to have to face this team another couple of days later, I give the Liberty a little bit of credit there for having to come back and then blowing them out in game one, 83-69. Who needs to step up for the Dream to have another performance like they did on the Thursday, the final day of the regular season? I want to see more consistency from – um the starters, but in order to see the starters, they have to play the entire fourth quarter. The starters were not in. And I think in a playoff atmosphere, it's not the best to have your best players on the bench, despite the score differential, because we see what can happen when we, when we viewed Phoenix and Minnesota, anything can go. However it, it goes, it's just all a matter of heart. And so the, the, the players that could have pushed for Atlanta didn't even get the opportunity to also, I want to see Jordan Cannon in her, in her offensive game um, mm. really take those shots. And she's a great facilitator and she's a great leader on the team. But just you need you need something when Ryan Howard doesn't really get her offensive flow going into the third quarter and Tina Charles doing what she can do. But we just need one more extra threat for the Atlanta Dream so that they can hang in there for the New York Liberty next game. You mentioned the open shots. Atlanta attempted only 13 open field goals in game one. It was the fewest since we ever started tracking that sort of stuff. So the defense for New York came out to play. I I, fl- yeah. And they were yeah. too, Sam. So it was like, yeah. what can you do? No, no question about it. I, I want to go back to Liberty for just a second, because like I said, they have a lot of expectations coming mm-hmm. into this round of the WNBA playoffs, right? Trying to bring home the WNBA championship for the first time in their franchise's history. They have the pieces in place to do it. Did you get any more confidence watching them in person and talking to the team today? Oh, yeah. I mean, they. what I was worried about is the the trauma that they would carry from last season. But I don't yes, know yeah. that. Um, John Paul Jones said, hey, we can't do anything about that. You know, mm-hmm. um, she had a beautiful quote. I can't quite recall it right now, but she had a beautiful quote about how when your opportunity, if you fall, like fall, it's another another opportunity to get better. And they've gotten better. They have, have another season of gelling. They know each other better. They know how each other, the style of play. Sabrina has been asked um, to play a different role for the team this year, and she's risen to that occasion. And the off-the-court things. Let me just take a, a minute to go off the court with them. When you have to deal with a teammate that is is really facing grief, like mm-hmm. Anna Sloot losing her mom in June, 
her mom Jan um, lost the battle to cancer. It it brings you together in a way that you you have to come together as a family. And Sandy Brondello said this team is a family. And Courtney Vandersloot said, my team accepts me no matter what version of myself I bring each day. And you see that because of their adaptability for Courtney, it kind of translates to, hey, if my teammate's not really performing well in the court, we can adjust and we can step up in, in, in the, her presence and really fill the void of what's happening. All right, I'm glad you bring up Courtney Vandersloot because, yes, it was an absolutely emotional season, both on and off the floor. But what was really cool to see was Courtney did become the all-time playoff assist leader in that matchup. So with that being said, let's take a look at Game Changing Connection presented by AT&T. Vandersloot needed just three assists to break Sue Bird's record for all-time playoff assists. She did that in uh, the first couple of minutes. And one of those assists, two of them actually being to Brianna Stewart. So you literally just mentioned, Ari, and rightfully so, this has been in a, real, a really emotional season for the Liberty point guard. Um, what's impressed you most about how she's been able to obviously accomplish these feats while dealing with everything off the floor? I'm impressed with her flexibility of playing whatever role that Sandy Brandello asks of her. She could have easily changed her energy because she was taken out of the starting lineup today, Leona Fubich stepped in her place in there. But Courtney Vandersloot is still a great point guard. She still knows how to facilitate and, and move um, the ball. She knows how to get her teammates involved, and you saw this. And And I'm glad that the record reflects exactly what she did today. Yeah, so Courtney Vandersloot and the Liberty going to be right back at it, taking on the Dream as they go up one game to nil after tonight's victory. Just down the road from us in Bristol, Connecticut, we had the Indiana Fever taking on the Connecticut Sun in Mohegan Sun Arena, one of the most hyped matchups in this first round of the playoffs. All right, first quarter, Dijon Carrington finding Dewana Bonner, cutting back door for the easy layup. Sun take the early lead. First half winding down. Clark trying to get it going. Bonner played great defense on her all day long. Swatch that one away. Third quarter, Bonner smartly uses the screen, goes into the layup, and the Sun up nine. Later in the third, son of 12, A.T., finding Marina Mabry, maybe the best pickup, and she knocks down the three at the deadline. Son starting to pull away. Fourth quarter now, Bonner drives, finds Mabry, corner, hits another three. Son go up 14. Next son possession now, Mabry, she's feeling it, pulling way downtown, knocks it down. Son win this one going away, 93 to 69. One of the biggest moves at the trade deadline, Ari, was Connecticut bringing in Marina Mabry, her performance tonight, I think, solidified her as maybe the best uh, mid-season move for the entire league. What impressed you most about her performance? Well, first of all, if I'm Connecticut, I'm like, shout out to my shooter, right? And it's <laughs> because Ty, Ty Harris went down with whatever injury. Yeah. That, that's you're, you, you're losing some offense there. And so Marina Mabry, not only with her offensive presence, but she's just firing. She knows how to get under player skin. Sometimes it's not everything that's reflected in the, in the stat sheet and in the box score, but Marina knows how to get in the head of their, of their competitors. And especially knowing that Indiana Fever is a young team and Marina does have that playoff experience. I just, I am entertained. I, if I'm Connecticut, I'm happy that I have great offense from her. Um, she can get her teammates fired. Up. Marina Mabry was the missing firecracker. I mean, not saying that Connecticut was any shortness yeah. of firecracker. They do have to watch <laughs> Let's be for real. But she just added um, extra energy, that extra spark that you need in the playoffs. Well, they needed some offense too, right? And I think she's led them since the Olympic break. Uh, in, that's right. Yeah. 10 points per game. So she's been a huge help on the offensive end. All right, let's turn it over to the fever now. I'm not going to put a ton of blame on Caitlin Clark in her first game of the WNBA postseason that she's ever played in. But how can the Fever win a game in Connecticut? Because, look, if they win one and take this thing back to Gamebridge, th th this is a, a real series now. Well, you know Connecticut and the Fever play each other very uh, – just aggressively and yes. see that type of basketball. It's the scrappiness, the grit. Nothing comes easy and nothing came easy for the fever today. Caitlin shot two of 13 from three, four of 17 from field. Um, Kelsey Mitchell, two from 10 from three, nine from 20 from field. And though Kelsey still finished with 21 points and Caitlin still finished with eight assists. Um, when you have your, your players who normally make those shots, not making them, it, it throws things into a little bit of a disarray, especially in a playoff time where it's, it's, it's getting to be must win. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. They just have to do better offensively. They got the open looks. They just weren't hitting them. And so 
just just figuring out a way to have those balls drop. And sometimes the ball just doesn't want to drop, and that's fine. But um, just you know, figuring out how to not have both of your three point shooting stars in a slump, but a right. little, little business with her double double. Here's one thing I did love about this game. At the end of the day, this is the playoffs. This was a physical game between these two teams. And to the referee's credit, they let them play, at least early on uh, in this game. All right, I, I do want to touch on Caitlin Clark a little bit more. Yeah. Obviously, this is her first time experiencing this. A ton of pressure on her shoulders. You mentioned the stats. What can her teammates do to help her? And also, what can she do to feel a little bit more comfortable and, and put points on the board? Well, I don't think Caitlin Clark is any... Um... Shot, she's not shying away from the pressure. If anything, she's yeah. been getting pressure all season. Uh, it's 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 almost like people don't realize that playoffs are a very different ball game. And I'm not mm-hmm. talking about anyone doesn't realize the the general public who's just consuming WNBA playoffs for the first time. They don't realize how much experience in the playoffs really comes into account when you're playing a playoff game. You have the Connecticut Sun that has really been the bridesmaid for so long. They've been right there. They're, they're a championship-level team that is hungry for, for more. And Indiana Fever just got back here. So, like, yeah. I yeah. understand Caitlin Clark and the pressure. Um, there's a whole team of people that is feeling the pressure because they're all the eyes are on them. But the Connecticut Sun is hungry. They're physical. They've been here before. They have veteran leadership that can really, really infiltrate the entire team. Their shooting is going well. Their defense is great. Connecticut Sun is so well-rounded, whereas Indiana, yes, they've been clicking lately. They've been trending up. But this is a new ballgame, a new atmosphere when you enter the playoffs. All right, so despite being named AP Rookie of the Year earlier today, CeCe wasn't playing like her usual self uh, against the Sun. Here's what she had to say post game. We were right there, and I felt like we just played a crappy game. Like, the flow of the game was really bad. Um, I don't know if that was the refing. and I was probably partly us because we, sh- we struggled to get stops at times, but also, like, the clock getting messed up. It was just one thing after the next. But we can win. It's, it's not anything about the building. It's not about the gym. It's not about the hoops. Like... I have all the confidence in the world in this team, and everybody in our locker room does, and I know we'll be a lot better on Wednesday. Final game of the day. What a day it has been in the WNBA. Uh, We have the five-seed Seattle taking on the Las Vegas Aces, seeking their three-peat. What do you want to see in this matchup, Ari? I want to see how Jewel Lloyd shows up. We know all season she's been kind of struggling um, offensively when it comes to Jewel Lloyd's standard her, but also how they're going to compensate for Ezzy Megligor not being in the game. And so just this is a Seattle Storm team who knows each other, but it's still their first year together. But they have a lot of veterans who've been here before. So how are they going to mesh? And yeah, that's that's what I'm looking forward to. I don't think they're as intimidated by the Aces as teams would have been in the previous years, but the Aces are clicking. They they are they are being held down by the Asia Wilson. You name yep. it. And just seeing what Aces are going to bring tonight and what the Seattle Storm is going to bring tonight. All right. So you said Jewel Lloyd. You mentioned her. I, I want to ask you about a player that you're keeping an eye out for for the Aces. For the Aces, Chelsea Gray. Right. We were we were all wondering if Chelsea Gray is OK this whole season. Is she at full health? She's been playing well lately. I want to see how she's going to show up tonight. Last but, not, last but not least, I, I got to ask you about Asia. Right. Unanimous MVP. Um I heard some people talking, and I want to ask you, has Asia Wilson put together the best season in WNBA history this year? Absolutely, and the stats prove that Asia Wilson is the best player in the world who's putting up the the best numbers that there have been ever. And so, Asia, take all your flowers. I hope you feel all the love. I know you like to project and, and, and not really receive that and give it to everybody else, but you deserve it. I understand that those stats don't come without your teammates, but all the work that you've put in and you've led by example and created such a great winning championship mentality for your team, you deserve that unanimous vote. Happy third MVP. Well, it's just been a, a great start to the WNBA playoffs. We have so much more coming your way. We will also see you after game one of the finals on October 10th. Uh, But we have so many more wrap-up shows to come throughout the duration of the playoffs. Ari, thank you so much for joining us. That's going to do it for us tonight. Thank you so much for watching the wrap-up presented by AT&T. For Ari Chambers, I'm Sam Ravitch saying so long. We will see you in a couple of days.